You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a PhD holding historian, a professor, and the creator of History That Doesn't Suck, a podcast that makes legit, seriously researched American history come to life through entertaining stories. Join me for a chronological telling of the United States story, from the revolution to fractious civil war, tenacious inventors, brave reformers, and more. With more than 100 episodes, you can already binge listen your way from 1776 to the early 20th century. Listen to History That Doesn't Suck on Spotify. Thanks for tuning in to episode 64 of our Civil War podcast. My name is Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello, y'all. Welcome to the podcast. Before we get rolling, we wanted to let you guys know that at the end of this show, there will be a special announcement. And not to give anything away, but it has to do with world peace and puppies. No, it doesn't. (laughs) Tracy's right. Um, It's even better than world peace and puppies. But you guys will just have to stay tuned till the end of the episode to find out what the special announcement's really about. Uh, For right now, let's get to the real business at hand, which is mayhem in Missouri. In the early days of the Civil War, both Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis were acutely sensitive to the critical balance of allegiances in the states of Kentucky and Missouri. Both leaders realized that the key to success in the Western theater of the war would belong to whoever could hold those crucial states. And significantly, Kentucky and Missouri were the only slave states beyond the Appalachian Mountains that hadn't declared themselves for one side or the other in the aftermath of the attack on Fort Sumter. And in Missouri and Kentucky, uh, loyalties were so precariously balanced that the two states could go either way with momentous results. The two states' critical importance stemmed from their strategic location as border states between North and South. Rich and I want to encourage y'all to actually check out a map and find Kentucky and Missouri and see just where they're located between North and South, and that'll help y'all understand why they're strategically so important. So, while you guys do that, I'll let you know that we'll cover Kentucky's situation later on, But for right now, we're going to focus in on Missouri. Uh, With this show and the next, we'll give you guys some quick background about Missouri's history and about its rocky relationship with its next-door neighbor, Kansas. But after setting the stage with that background info, we'll use the rest of this episode, and also the next one, to talk about the mayhem that broke out in Missouri with the start of the Civil War. And then that'll lead us right up to the Battle of Wilson's Creek. As y'all might remember, the area that was to become Missouri was part of the lands that the United States gained through the Louisiana Purchase, the fantastic real estate deal that Thomas Jefferson made with Napoleonic France back in 1803. A decade and a half later, when the Territory of Missouri applied to join the Union, there existed at that moment a precarious political balance between 11 slave states and 11 free states. But if Missouri came in as a slave state, it would upset that balance. And so there was a fierce battle in the halls of Congress over Missouri's application for statehood. Only after a bruising two-year controversy was that impasse broken by a compromise in 1820 that provided for the admission of Missouri as a slave state and Maine as a free state. So, for the moment, that maintained the slave state-free state balance. Looking toward the future, though, the Missouri Compromise also called for a line to be drawn across the Louisiana Purchase Lands at latitude 36 degrees 30 minutes north, above which slavery would be permanently banned except in the case of Missouri, of course. Now, as some saw it, the Missouri Compromise and the 3630 line was the best thing since sliced bread, since it solved a major crisis. But to the aging Thomas Jefferson, the arrangement over the expansion of slavery, quote, 
like a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. End quote. With equal foresight, an even older John Adams regarded it as the quote, title page to a great tragic volume. End quote. And indeed, the bitter controversy over the extension of slavery erupted once more after the United States again acquired a considerable chunk of territory, this time as a result of the Mexican War. The debate raged until Congress approved the Compromise of 1850. But that agreement was doomed to last only four years. That was because Senator Stephen Douglas thought he had the perfect solution to the political turmoil over slavery that had racked the country for decades and threatened to divide his Democratic Party, and that solution was popular sovereignty. Stephen Douglas basically wanted to let the people decide. And so, in January 1854, Douglas introduced the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which proclaimed that, quote, the questions pertaining to slavery in the territories and in the new states to be formed therefrom are to be left to the decision of the people residing therein through their representatives. End quote. None of this is new to longtime listeners to the podcast, so it also won't be a surprise when we tell you that since the Kansas Nebraska Act repealed the Missouri Compromise and then for good measure also threatened to undo the Compromise of 1850, the act, rather than solve the problem of the extension of slavery, it only made it worse. Immediately after the bill was introduced, both sides, anti-slavery advocates and their pro-slavery opponents, both sides realized that where popular sovereignty was the rule, numbers were power. Then-Senator William Seward of New York defined the upcoming struggle for Kansas and accepted the challenge, quote, on behalf of the cause of freedom. We will engage in competition for the virgin soil of Kansas, and God give the victory to the side that is stronger in numbers as it is in the right. End quote. But while northern anti-slavery advocates organized companies of settlers to move west to Kansas, their pro-slavery opponents had the advantage because they could merely cross over the border from Missouri and stake their claims. But the pro-slavery side didn't simply rely on legitimate settlers to press their case. During the March 1855 election for Kansas's first territorial legislature, the pro-slavery Missourians sent an armed force across the border to ensure the result of the balloting was to their liking. New York newspaperman Horace Greeley dubbed these men border ruffians and portrayed them as uncouth, bloodthirsty demons. But many of them were, in fact, leading citizens of Missouri who were strong proponents of slavery. The most prominent border ruffian was Missouri Senator David Rice Atchison. Another leader of the border ruffians was a future governor of Missouri, Claiborne Fox Jackson. The Missouri border ruffians were successful in their attempt to skew the result of the 1855 election to choose Kansas's first territorial legislature. Although there were only 2,905 eligible voters in the territory at that time, somehow 6,307 votes were cast, and, not surprisingly, almost all of the votes went to pro-slavery candidates. The Free Soilers, having no success in obtaining fair elections, decided to form their own territorial government. Because of the violence that resulted from this political turmoil, the state became known as Bleeding Kansas in the years before the Civil War. For example, in May 1856, David Atchison led some 800 Missouri border ruffians to the Free Soil Settlement of Lawrence, Kansas, and sacked the town. In retaliation, anti-slavery zealot John Brown and his band murdered five pro-slavery men. Brown's gruesome exploit set off a round of retaliatory bloodshed and cross-border violence by both sides that will continue right up through the Civil War. In Kansas, the years 1857 and 1858 saw a series of votes on constitutions to be submitted for statehood. During that time, free soilers were gaining the advantage politically over their pro-slavery opponents, but nevertheless, the drive for statehood was stalemated for three more years. 
There was one last burst of atrocities in 1858 as Jayhawkers, the anti-slavery bands of marauders in southeast Kansas, were attacking their pro-slavery neighbors and also crossing over into Missouri to strike out against residents there. In retaliation, pro-slavery Missourians crossed over into Kansas and executed five men. And just as a footnote, but in October 1859, Kansas voters ratified a constitution making their troubled territory a free state, and Kansas was finally admitted into the Union on January 29, 1861, scarcely three months before the attack on Fort Sumter. But anyway, it's set against all of that background turmoil that Missouri, from its admission as a slave state, up through the hullabaloo over bleeding Kansas and the accompanying cross-border violence between anti-slavery and pro-slavery forces, it's set against all of that background turmoil that we now come to Missouri and the outbreak of the Civil War. At the top of the podcast, we mentioned Missouri's strategic importance as a border state between North and South. With the outbreak of the Civil War, both sides could read a map, and so they realized that if Missouri went South, it would imperil the Union's major routes West, blocking off Kansas and flanking Southern Illinois. Most important of all, Missouri dominated the key 250-mile stretch of the Mississippi River between St. Louis and Memphis. In that vital stretch, the Great River was joined by two of its main tributaries, the Ohio River and the Missouri River. As we'll see when we talk about Kentucky, in the Bluegrass State, at the start of the Civil War, there was tension between secessionists and unionists, but both sides in Kentucky kind of adopted a live-and-let-live attitude. In Missouri, however, the tension between secessionists and unionists quickly erupted into violence almost right from the get-go. The southeastern counties and the extreme northwestern portions of the state, along the Kansas border, were solidly for the south. There, bushwhacking broke out almost immediately after Lincoln's election in November 1860. Much of this, however, was merely a continuation of the raiding between Kansas Jayhawkers and Missouri border ruffians that had been going on for quite a while already. And then there was St. Louis, by far the largest city in the state, with a population in 1860 of more than 160,000 people. And by that time, the city was increasingly taking on a free soil flavor from immigrants from across the Mississippi River in Illinois and also from a flourishing community of German refugees and exiles who had found their home in St. Louis after fleeing political repression in Germany. While the established political leaders of St. Louis were predominantly sympathetic to the South, the city's new German-American citizens were solidly for the Union and had no sympathy at all with slavery. Elsewhere in Missouri, neither Unionist nor Secessionist were clearly ahead, In the narrow belt of slaveholding counties along the Missouri River, Southern sentiment was strong, but ironically, many slave owners opposed secession because they believed Lincoln's assertions that he had no intention of touching slavery in the areas where it was sanctioned by the Constitution, and so they weren't willing to risk their valuable slave property on the shaky chances of a rebellion. As the Deep South began to secede from the Union and the country slid toward civil war, In Missouri, the struggle between Unionists and Secessionists was to a large degree defined by the ambitions and attitudes of several key men. In his book, Battle Cry of Freedom, James McPherson explains that, quote, Dynamic personalities polarized this struggle even more than the situation warranted. On one extreme stood Governor Claiborne Fox Jackson, a pro-slavery Democrat and one-time leader of the border ruffians. On the other stood Congressman Francis P. Blair, Jr., whose connections in Washington included a brother as postmaster general and a father as an advisor to Lincoln. Blair had used his influence to secure the appointment of Captain Nathaniel Lyon as commander of the soldiers stationed at the U.S. Arsenal in St. Louis, the largest arsenal in the slave states, 
with 60,000 muskets and other arms in storage. A Connecticut Yankee and a 27-year veteran of the Army, Lyon was a free soiler whose intense blue eyes, red beard, and commanding voice offered better clues than his small stature to the zeal and courage that made him an extraordinary leader of men. Lyon had served in Kansas when Claiborne Fox Jackson had led pro-slavery invaders from Missouri. In 1861, the Lion and the Fox once again faced each other. End quote. Newly elected Governor Jackson was a noted orator, and in his January 1861 inaugural address, he told his fellow Missourians, quote, Common origin, pursuits, taste, manners, and customs bind together in one brotherhood the states of the South. Missouri should make a timely declaration of her determination to stand by her sister slaveholding states, with whose institutions and people she sympathizes, end quote. And then after the fall of Fort Sumter, when Abraham Lincoln issued his call for 75,000 militia to put down the rebellion, Jackson replied, quote, Your requisition is illegal, unconstitutional, revolutionary, inhuman, diabolical, and cannot be complied with, end quote. But when it came to actual secession, Governor Jackson found himself frustrated. Jackson had convinced a special session of the state legislature to call for a convention to consider secession, but the majority of the delegates Missourians sent to that convention were Unionists, and much to the governor's dismay, when they met on March 4th in St. Louis, they voted 98 to 1 to reject secession. Jackson dropped the issue for the time being, but behind the scenes he continued to scheme to take Missouri out of the Union. With the fall of Fort Sumter and Lincoln's call for troops, Jackson appeared to have the favorable turn of events he'd been waiting for. Besides his defiant rejection of Lincoln's proclamation, Jackson called for another special session of the legislature, and he also ordered the mustering of the state militia. Meanwhile, Frank Blair Jr., worried that Jackson intended to use the state militia to seize the St. Louis arsenal, Blair got the War Department to grant Captain Lyon the extraordinary authority to enlist up to 10,000 citizens in the federal service to maintain public order and defend national property. It was Frank Blair and Nathaniel Lyon's plan to counter Governor Jackson's state militia with the Home Guard, which were units mostly organized from St. Louis's strongly pro-Union German-American community. Tensions increased when, on April 20th, Secessionists seized the Missouri Depot, a small federal armory located at Liberty in the northwestern part of the state. The tension between the two sides ratcheted up another notch at the beginning of May when Governor Jackson ordered a contingent of state militia into encampment on the outskirts of St. Louis. The governor insisted the militiamen were on a routine training exercise, but Lyon was convinced Jackson intended to use the militia to seize the all-important federal arsenal in St. Louis. So Lyon deployed Hoban Guardsmen at key spots around the city and shipped many of the arsenal's contents across the river to a more secure location in Illinois. Despite those precautions, the activity at the militia encampment, called Camp Jackson, the activities at Camp Jackson aggravated Lyon's anxiety. The story goes that the suspicious army captain borrowed a carriage from Frank Blair's mother-in-law and, disguised in a dress, sunbonnet, and veil, Lyon supposedly drove through the militia camp and returned from his reconnaissance, convinced that the militiamen represented a clear and present danger to St. Louis and to the arsenal. And with that, Lyon and Blair decided to use the federalized home guard to move against Camp Jackson. In reality, while the governor had been in communication with Jefferson Davis, asking for and receiving artillery to batter down the walls of the St. Louis arsenal, the state militiamen at Camp Jackson actually represented a mixed bag of loyalties. Some, following the lead of their commander, Daniel M. Frost, were pro-secession, while a number of others were either sympathetic to the Union cause or, at the very least, neutral in sentiment. Nevertheless, Lyon assembled a force of some 7,000 men to confront an estimated 900 militiamen. 
As we already mentioned, the majority of Lyon's home guardsmen were German Americans, but he also had two companies of regulars, soldiers of the 2nd U.S. Infantry. On May 10th, Lyon led his troops out of St. Louis toward Camp Jackson. Many of the Federalized Home Guardsmen, although they were well armed thanks to the contents of the arsenal, many of them didn't have uniforms or even proper cartridge boxes, so they carried their ammunition and percussion caps in their pockets. One of the Guardsmen, Sergeant Otto Ladman, described his unit's departure from the city. Quote, at about one o'clock, the head of our column marched out of the arsenal, led by our regimental band, playing a gay march, our national colors proudly fluttering in the soft, balmy May breeze. If we did present a rather motley appearance in our simple citizen's garb, our shining new muskets and their glittering bayonets sparkled brightly in the rays of the sun, and with proud steps we eagerly marched forward to strike the first offensive blow in St. Louis. End quote. By 3.15 that afternoon, the Federal troops had arrived at Camp Jackson. Word of Lyon's march from the city had spread quickly, and perhaps a third of the state militiamen had time to flee before the Federals closed in around the camp and sealed off all escape. Frost's remaining men offered no resistance as their encampment was surrounded. Once his overwhelming force was in place, Lyon sent the militia commander a demand for immediate surrender. Frost responded by protesting that Lyon had no justification to attack state militia engaged in the lawful performance of their duties, and he asked for a personal meeting with Lyon. The federal commander sent back a note saying that if Frost didn't surrender in ten minutes, Lyon would order his men to open fire. Frost angrily rep replied that, quote, I never for a moment conceived the idea that so illegal and unconstitutional a demand would be made by any officer of the United States Army, end quote. But since he was, quote, wholly unprepared to defend my command from this unwarranted attack, end quote, he would surrender. The actual surrender itself was peaceable, but then Lyon gave the militiamen the opportunity to take the oath of allegiance, and only a few agreed to do so. The others protested that they had already sworn allegiance to the United States, and to their way of thinking, to do it again would be an admission they had been in rebellion. The militia's stubborn refusal to cooperate apparently made Lyon a tad upset, and so rather than simply give them their parole there at the encampment, he decided he'd publicly humiliate them by marching them as prisoners back into the city to the arsenal. And that's the point where things started to go seriously off the rails, as Lyon's demonstration to cow the militiamen turned into a train wreck. It took several hours for preparations for the march back into the city to be completed, but then the home guardsmen started off, escorting their sullen prisoners. But by that time, crowds of people, drawn by the excitement, had started to gather outside the city. Many people in the crowd were simply curious spectators, but many gathered along the route of march were hostile toward the German immigrants who made up the home guard calling them damned Dutchmen, and very soon the scene turned ugly as a barrage of ethnic slurs, curses, and rocks were hurled at the guardsmen with increasing venom. Daniel Frost later said that, quote, As all St. Louis was excited to madness that day, the wild excitement of the unthinking crowd and the animosity of the raw, undisciplined troops were rapidly increasing, end quote. Some of the more aggressive in the crowd apparently pressed forward, trying to break the ranks of those guarding the militiamen, but leveled bayonets kept them back. It was at that point that one or several people in the mob apparently pulled out pistols and began firing at the soldiers. Seeing some of their comrades hit by bullets, some of the guardsmen began firing into the crowd, and the effect spread through the ranks as other companies, believing that orders had been given to open fire, loosed volleys into the crowd. William Tecumseh Sherman, who happened to be one of the curious spectators who had come out from the city, recalled running for his life to escape the bullets flying in every direction. One of the soldiers later recalled that, quote, The whole commons were covered with a mass of fleeing men, women, horses, and vehicles of all kind, running pell-mell down the line of our regiment for the shelter of the city, end quote. Frantic officers quickly stopped the firing, after perhaps two or three minutes, but by then the damage was done. 
Twenty-eight men, women, and children lay dead or mortally wounded. Three enlisted men and an officer in the federal ranks, as well as three militiamen, were either killed outright or fatally wounded. Scores more in the crowd were wounded but survived. An eyewitness said, quote, The wounded and dying made the late beautiful field look like a battleground, and a more fearful and ghastly sight is seldom seen. End quote. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. I believe that all history, no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation, Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast, wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. The question of responsibility for what became known as the Camp Jackson Massacre has been debated ever since that fateful day in May 1861. But the reality is that once Lyon made the unfortunate decision to march his prisoners from the camp into the city, an ugly incident became almost unavoidable as the raw, undisciplined troops mixed with angry citizens. Hysteria gripped St. Louis in the wake of the incident. Rumors ran wild. One newspaper reported that, quote, in some parts of the city, a perfect panic prevailed. Had there been notice of a destructive hurricane or an earthquake about to visit the city, there could scarcely have been a more disturbed sense of impending peril than existed in many quarters, end quote. Secessionists fled St. Louis, and for the rest of the Civil War, the important river city was secured for the Union. In fact, it was thereafter used as headquarters for Federal Army operations in the Western Theater of the War. But a hundred or so miles west of St. Louis, in the state capital of Jefferson City, legislators were in a frenzy. Led to believe by Governor Jackson that Lyon would be momentarily descending upon the State House, one legislator later recalled that, quote, many members had belts strapped around their waists and from one to three pistols or bowie knives fastened to them, end quote. On May 14th, four days after the Camp Jackson massacre, legislators passed a bill creating the Missouri State Guard. Recruits were to swear allegiance to Missouri alone, support the state constitution, and obey the orders of the governor. Jackson gave command of the State Guard to Sterling Price, a former state legislator, U.S. congressman, and a Mexican war hero. Recruits to the secessionist cause began pouring into Jefferson City, and Jackson and Price worked to organize, arm, and equip the rapidly swelling numbers of state guardsmen. In the first week of June, Lyon, newly appointed a brigadier general, was persuaded to give Jackson and Price safe passage from Jefferson City to St. Louis so that they could meet with him and Frank Blair. 
quote, for the purpose of effecting, if possible, a pacific solution of the domestic troubles of Missouri, end quote. On the morning of June 11th, the four men and a couple of aides met at the Planters House Hotel in St. Louis. The Planters House meeting was a last desperate effort to prevent Missouri from sliding over the precipice into full-scale civil war. Sterling Price, the governor, and his aide, a man named Thomas Sneed, had never met Nathaniel Lyon, but all three had known Frank Blair for years. Four or five hours were spent on exchanging proposals and counterproposals in an attempt to reach an accord, but despite much discussion, both sides proved much too far apart to agree on any point and much too set in their views to compromise in any way. Blair and Lyon viewed any proposal of Jackson's and Price's to be a trick, designed to deliver Missouri into the Confederate camp, while Jackson and Price viewed any proposal of Blair's to be designed to force down their throats an anti-slavery, anti-Southern position that violated their sense of loyalty to Missouri. Clearly, no agreement was possible. Although initially quiet, Lyon soon weighed in. After hours of discussion, the fiery army officer had had enough. The governor's aide, Sneed, later recalled that when Lyon spoke, it was, quote, slowly, deliberately, coldly, and with the peculiar intonation that showed he meant every word that he uttered, end quote. The authority of the United States, Lyon said, was supreme in Missouri and must be respected. Sneed remembered how Lyon said that, quote, Rather than concede to the state of Missouri for one single instant the right to dictate to my government in any matter, however unimportant, I would, rising as he said this and pointing in turn to everyone in the room, see you and you and you and you and every man, woman, and child in the state dead and buried. End quote. Lyon then turned to Governor Jackson and ended the meeting with these words, quote, This means war. In an hour, one of my officers will call for you and conduct you out of my lines, end quote. After dropping that bombshell, Lyon then marched out of the room. And that dramatic exit seems like a good point for us to leave the story for now. So next week, we'll pick back up right here and continue our march toward the Battle of Wilson's Creek. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is actually an article in a back issue of North and South magazine in volume two, number five of North and South from June, 1999. There's an article titled don't yield an inch the story of the Missouri state guard. As you might be able to guess that article is about the Missouri state guard. And it will give you a greater appreciation for the organization, activities, and personalities involved with that body of militia. As always, you can find all of our recommendations at the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.blogspot.com. Before we get to the special announcement, we wanted to be sure to thank Peter D. from the UK for his donation since the last episode. And then we also wanted to remind y'all that the music you hear at the beginning and end of every show is from the song Midnight on the Water, and we use it with the kind permission of Spiritwood Music. All right, so the special announcement is that we're having a March Madness t-shirt giveaway. And for those of you who aren't from the U.S., a March Madness is the name given to the craziness that surrounds the big college basketball tournament here. Uh, but we're stealing it for our t-shirt giveaway. And yes, we know it's not March yet, but a lot of the U.S. has been suffering through a pretty brutal winter. And so if you're like Tracy and me, uh, you can use a little something to look forward to and get excited about. Uh, So we're rolling this out now. What we're going to do is give away one t-shirt with the podcast logo, just like the shirts Rich and I wore at Gettysburg this past summer. To qualify for the giveaway, you need to go to the website between now and Saturday, March 29th and make a donation of $10 or more to support the podcast, and that'll put your name in the hat. And we'll literally put the names of everyone who donates onto slips of paper and put those slips of paper into a hat, and then during the episode we record on Sunday, March 30th, 
we'll pull a name out of the hat and that lucky person will win the t-shirt. And to make it more interesting, you can increase your chances at winning by increasing your donation. So for every multiple of $10 you donate, your name will go onto another slip of paper and go into the hat. Uh, for example, if you donate $20, then your name will go into the hat on two slips of paper. If you donate $30, then your name will go into the hat on three slips of paper, and so on. And we'll ship the t-shirt anywhere in the world, so since we know we have listeners all across the globe. So we'll contact you about the size you want and everything, and then send it to you after we get it made up just for you. And yes, this is pretty much a shameless but fun way to try to get some of you guys to support the podcast. And just so you know, with everyone's donations, uh, whether it's part of this t-shirt giveaway or not, uh, we always use those donations in uh, one of three ways. Uh, either to buy books. Or to buy printer cartridges. Yeah, that was an unexpected expense, uh, but we found that in doing research and just putting together each show, uh, we go through printer cartridges like nobody's business. So anyway, uh, books for research, printer cartridges, and then there's also the monthly cost for the server, which is a, a podcast hosting service where we keep or store each episode of the podcast so you guys can download it uh, through whatever means you choose. But So basically, that's the deal with our March Madness t-shirt giveaway and your donations. Uh, so thank you in advance to those of you who do take this opportunity to support the podcast, and we're excited that one of you will win that t-shirt. But we also just feel we're doing something special with this podcast, and so we appreciate everyone who listens and the encouragement that so many of you give us through messages and comments and through reviews on iTunes and whatnot, um, please know that that all means a lot. And so having said that, we'll sign off for now by thanking all of you for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. We'll be back next week, and we'll continue talking about the dramatic events out in Missouri, but until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.